Hi everyone, I'm Minaja, and so this talk is on algorithmic fairness and algorithmic discrimination. So I guess like recently, um, especially in this past year, there's been a rise of like uh, people caring about like ethical data science, um, partially due to the fact that like um, data scientists tend to be in like more left of center politically, and so like people have been interested in how do I use my data skills, um, sort of to make the world a better place um, in response to the election of President Trump. Uh, so this idea of like how we do ethical data science is becoming up, like how do we like protect people and how do we not end up like Uber? Uh, no offense to anyone from Uber in here. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to be focusing on a specific idea in ethical um, data science, which is like algorithmic fairness. How do you make algorithms that do not adversely impact any particular group of people? And so I'm going to talk about this in a way that sort of like ties into how we already do machine learning and data science. And so it's not like something extra you to think about. It's like something that we already do sort of think about. We just need to I guess look at it from a different perspective. And so, like, the motivation for this is, well, we're using data science and machine learning a lot more um, for pretty much a bunch of applications. So this could be things like, um, who do we give bank loans to? How we decide um, prison sentencing and also teacher evaluations. Um, these are things that have, like, huge ramifications on people's lives. And we like statistical models because they tend to be more consistent and have better accuracy compared to human uh, judgment. A human can be tired, a human can have a bad day, and they're very inconsistent in their judgments of, with terms of who gets a bank loan or not. Uh, but the issue is when we train these models, we're sort of training on historical data that was based off human judgment. And so as a result, these models inherit that human bias. So if a bank, loans, a bank didn't like giving loans out to a particular group of people, this could be people of a particular race, it could be something even uh, bit more arbitrary, like oh, people who have uh, colored hair, maybe blue or red, for example, looking at some people in the audience. <laughs> um, and that model will sort of inherit that bias, and now when you deploy this in practice, it's sort of going to amplify that, because this model can now apply to like tens of thousands of people, and sort of reject people just who have these certain characteristics, and we don't want that. And so this is a nice quote by uh, former President Barack Obama. It basically says when CEOs come uh, tell them about leadership, they're just like, oh, we think about this problem the way it's like, you should think about this social good problem the way we think about building an app or building a widget. And President Obama was like, well, that's great. If I didn't have to worry about whether poor people could afford this app, or if I didn't have to think about whether the app, um, the widget had like unintended consequences, then those suggestions would be tra uh, terrific. And so I love this quote because it's sort of like we should think about these types of problems the way we think about apps. It's sort of like the Silicon Valley of government should be run like a business. Um, and I think it's interesting that as data scientists, we aren't really trained to think about like the unintended consequences of our models. We're sort of trained in like business intelligence mindset or product analytic mindset. It's like how do we maximize revenue for our company or how do we increase user engagement with our app? We're not taught to think about like, okay, is our app having unintended consequences? Are people being adversely affected by our product? And so, what are the main sources of these biases? So one can be oversampling of particular populations. So with, I guess, with police patrolling, um, certain neighborhoods are patrolled much more frequently by police. Uh, neighborhoods with a higher uh, percentage of ethnic minorities, uh, blacks and Hispanics, are tend to be patrolled more by police compared to predominantly white neighborhoods. As a result, you're, even if these neighborhoods have like crimes being considered at the same rate, if you sample more from this like, ethnic minority neighborhood, you're going to have more ethnic minorities in your uh, being arrested. On the other hand, you could also have underrepresentation of minority groups or protected groups. So this is a huge issue. So when Google Photos first launched in 2015, uh, there was an incident where some kids uploaded uh, pictures of themselves at their graduation. Uh, these kids were black, and so Google's photos, they see these pictures of these kids and auto tag these pictures of being of gorillas. Woo! Uh, so that was a huge PR disaster for Google. And so why does this occur? Because in Google's uh, pho uh, photos model, uh, the, basically they, they had a lot of examples of humans, but they didn't really have examples of what, like humans that were not like white or Asian. They didn't learn, really, the algorithm didn't really learn what like minorities look like. And so this caused this uh, issue to occur. Finally, there can be an issue of poorly cal uh, calibrated evaluations. So when you're training on human data, for example, like child protective services, uh, how they evaluate risks to a child is that it will basically go through a household and put it on a score from 1 to 20. So 1 is like minimal or no risk to the child in this household. 20 is like extreme risk to the chi uh, child in this, being in this household. Get that child out of the household now. And so if you look at this data, it turns out that you can actually see biases 
uh, based on the child's race. So children in white households, their risk tends to be lower. So if you have a white household and a black household uh, kid, and say like the true risk to both these households is 15, the white will be lower to like let's say 13, and the child in the black household will be raised to 17. So they raised, so like there's different calibrations in that like the way the child will be evaluated is based on the child's race. And so it's like very not standardized. I guess former, more formally talk about this idea of subjective measurement and calibration. Let's talk about uh, prison recidivism. So when prison recidivism, so this is when you have a prisoner and you decide to um, like release them, each parolee is assigned a score S. So this is a software called Compass. Um, it's a really black box algorithm and like is some controversies about it. But it basically assigns each prisoner a score S, representing effectively their likelihood to reoffend. And so if two prisoners receive the same score S, but one is white and the other is black, are they equally likely to be released? Um, so formally that is like, is the probability that of being released, given that you have some score S and are white, equal to the probability of being released and having the same score S and also being black? If yes, then this um, measure is well calibrated. If no, then there's obviously some issue. There's bias against one of, one of these two groups. And so I guess the real, um, I guess we to talk about adverse impact. And so when I usually try to talk about why this is important, I guess sometimes I get this response like, ah, oh, darn social justice warriors trying to like interest their politics into data science. Data science should be like apolitical and should be objective as possible. So why should those people care about this kind of stuff? Well, because we have disparate impact laws. These are labor laws that basically say when one group with a protective characteristic is like adversely impacted more so than other, even when the actions are neutral. So if you're not accidentally trying to um, adversely impact women or people of a certain racial group or people of a sexual um, orientation, but you do so anyways, you can still get in trouble. And so under Title VII uh, doctrines, adverse impact is defined as like substantially different rate of selection, which works to disadvantage a group of, um, disadvantage members of a particular race, sex, or ethnic group. So what is substantially different? Uh, that's somewhat subjective. It's sort of like how we do t-test uh, and p-value hypothesis testing. Like, what's the cutoff for the p-value? Well, we just say 0.05 because that's the like standard um, threshold we accept. And in this case, we can say like, what's the standard substantially different rate selection? We can say something like 20%, uh, things of that nature. If you're 20% more likely to, or less likely uh, to get some positive outcome just because you're a member of a particular race or sex or ethnic group, uh, then we can say that you've been adversely impacted. And so this is part of US laws. And so if you don't follow this, your company could get sued. And you deploy a model that adversely impacts one of the, a, group of, a protected group of people, your company gets sued, and then you get fired. And that's why people who don't really care about ethics should probably pay attention to this kind of stuff. And so this is a very good example. So the office supply company, Staples, they launched a pricing scheme um, in 2012 that lowered the prices for individuals who live within 20 miles of a rival store. Well, it turned out that both of your neighborhoods were commonly located near the rival stores, so individuals in these neighborhoods received the lower prices. Conversely, people in lower income neighborhoods received higher prices. And it turns out that the neighborhoods and income is sort of correlated very well with like other socioeconomic uh, variables. Mm -hmm. So when you do this, you accidentally discriminate against people of certain socioeconomic status. And they were thus adversely impacted by this pricing scheme. And so I think this is an interesting example because it really highlights the main point that just because you don't look at race, sex, or some other protected variable in your training data doesn't mean your model isn't learning these features implicitly. Like losing location and other demographic variables, Staples algorithm basically learn these socioeconomic um, predictors. And you got so like you can't just say, look, well, I took out race from my model, therefore I'm good. That doesn't work that way. You sort of need to test for this. And so how can we test for this? This is the idea of statistical parity. And so this idea of statistical parity is sort of heuristically what disparate impact tries to get at. Is like, are we more likely to receive the positive outcome given that we are not of the protected class? So it's essentially this like mathematical formalization of the adverse impact. And formally speaking, it's you have the protected class P, so this could be like race or this could be a gender, um, women or race can be like Asian, black, white, whatever. You have some model, your classifier, and you have the data. And the bias is defined as the probability of the model saying one, or like giving the positive outcome, given that you are not in the protected class, 
And I'll, give, I'll show an example in the next slide, if this is like math is too abstract for some of you. Um, minus the probability of getting the positive outcome, given that you are in the uh, protected class. And so parity is achieved when the bias is zero, otherwise your model is biased or, uh, or anti-biased towards this group. So for example, let's consider some census data. We want to identify whether race or sex are associated with like higher incomes. And so we'll use the label of like income being greater than 50,000 as our target variable. We want to predict like does this individual make more than 50,000 a year? And we want to see how that like is affected by race or gender. So here's some code that you can use to uh, essentially calculate this. And so the way you can think about this bias is sort of like a metric. Like when you do machine learning data science, you have some metrics to, uh, I guess, evaluate your models. You have like accuracy, you have precision, you have F1 score. Well, you can use, sort of use this bias as sort of like a, me a way to like measure the evaluate your model. And so you can calculate this bias, and then you can try against uh, different protected classes. So if you look at this data, and you can uh, try against women as a protected class, you can see that the bias against women in the census data is a 0.196. So what that means is that women are 20% less likely to, than compared to non-women in this data set to be making more than $50,000 a year. Uh, on the other hand, if you look at like Asians, uh, the bias against Asians in this data set is like negative 0.0256. So what that means is that Asians are 2.5% more likely compared to non-Asians to be making more than $50,000 a year. And so this is a metric you can use to sort of evaluate, like, um, is your model biased towards these particular groups or anti-biased towards a particular group? Does it favor certain groups? And like I said, so this is like a metric. So you can, you can train your model, and you can just like evaluate this, uh, this metric through your evaluations at the end where you're testing it. You basically run inside your test data set, get some scores, and you can look at, okay, is my model biased to, uh, against a particular group? And set some thresholds. You can say, if the, thresh, uh, the threshold is like 10%, you can say like, oh, hey, this model is too biased against women. We can't deploy this in practice. So now this is a, this is where the talk gets pretty more technical. Uh, so we're going to take a look at information theoretic approach to fairness. So first of all, how many of you have encountered information theory before? Woo, good amount of you. OK. So essentially, I guess for those of you who haven't, information theory what it is, is, well, probabilities give us a likelihood that an event will occur. But probabilities are not always intuitive to humans. Uh, during the presidential election, they said, like, oh, Trump has a 30% chance of winning. Uh, that event occurred, and everyone's like, how could this possibly happen? Uh, well, if you think about what 30% is, well, if you flip a coin and get, get heads two times in a row, that's 25% chance of occurring. No one flips a coin two times in a row and gets heads and is like, how does this possibly happen? <laughs> And so what information theory is, sort of in a way, it gives us a notion of how surprised we should be when a particular event occurs. Um, basically, like, low event, like a road probability event has high surprise because we're surprised when it occurs, whereas like, an event that occurs 95% like, of the time, we're not really surprised when that occurs. So it has low information. And information theory is like, very used in machine learning, uh, particularly for training decision trees, which is why we're, I'm bringing this up, because I'm going to talk about how we can sort of think about using information theory to train decision trees in a way that we don't uh, to deal with fairness. And so now I'll keep talking about some more information theory concepts. Uh, there are two things that we really care about. Uh, one is entropy. So entropy is sort of the amount of mess or randomness that's inherent to some random variable. It's sort of like the inherent randomness of a probability distribution. And you have two um, variables, x and y. The mutual information between them it's sort of a measure of how much is left in like x after we know the value of y. So if you have like two variables, weight and height, if I know someone's height, that gives me some insight to what their weight is. The taller you are, the probably heavier you're going to be. And so knowing your height gives me some insight into your weight. And the key thing about mutual information is it's sort of a like more general version of correlation. Uh, there can be things that have high mutual information but low correlation. And so to motivate this idea of a high correlation, um, high mutual information, no correlation, consider this problem. So we flip a coin. If heads, we get zero. Otherwise, we flip a second coin. If the second coin is heads, we get one. If the second coin is tails, we get negative one. So what's the correlation between the first coin flip and the final value produced? That final value is that zero, negative one, or one. Anyone have any ideas? 15. I hear, I'm hearing a lot of zeros, and you guys... All right, so we can like, try this out. We can run a simulation. And so this basically just does the process like 10,000 times. And we can see that the correlation between these two variables is like negative 
Why is that? Because correlation measures linear dependencies and or linear trends between two variables. So as one goes up, the other goes up, or as one goes up, the other goes down. Mutual information can capture nonlinear dependencies. Like the way I've structured this problem is a clear way that the pathway of how the first coin flip out influences the final value. But it's not a linear pattern. The mean of the uh, mean of the final value if I get heads is zero. The mean of the final value if I get tails is also zero. So there's like really no difference if you look at linear trend. The mean doesn't go up depending on the coin flip. It stays the same. But there is some information I can get by knowing the first coin flip. If I know the first coin flip, I know it's either going to be zero or it's going to be negative one or one. So there's a lot of information contained in those two. And so when you do the normalized mutual information, you get it's like almost it's got 0 0.81. So it's like almost one. So there's a lot of information between those two. So how does this tie back to this idea of fairness? Well, if we have some data x and some labels y, we can view the classification problem as maximizing the mutual information between the data and the labels. Like, we want a set of features. We want to learn the set of features that gives us the most information about the labels. But now we're going to add this problem. Uh, we're going to have these protected variables. So these can be like race or gender uh, and sex or orientation that we don't want to learn. And then we can view this classification task as sort of like a constrained optimization problem. We want to maximize the mutual information between our features and our labels while trying to minimize the mutual information between our protected variables and our features. And so formally this can be expressed as like maximizing the information between the data and the labels while minimizing the information minus the information between the protected class and the features. And this beta is sort of a coefficient to like determine how much we care about that. And so if you look at the, this really closely, and if you have some experience in data science and machine learning, and it's like close one hand over your eyes and squint a bit, it kind of looks like regularization for classification. Like you have the information gain minus the penalty term we get take. And so you can sort of think about this as sort of like a regularized regression, uh, regularized optimization problem or regularized classification. We care, like what does regularization do? It's sort of trade off between accuracy and complexity of a model. We want our model to take on, we try to penalize the model for being too complex because we want the model to have some nice properties. So we use this optimization is also the penalty between accuracy and complexity. Like, yeah, our model becomes less accurate because we care about the fact that we don't learn race or gender or sexual orientation, but now we have a model that's less complex, but it has this property that we care about. And so now how do we use this? And so fortunately, we don't have to implement this ourselves. There is a library called FairTest that already does this for us. And so this library is called FairTest. You can just like type it in on Google, and it'll take you to the GitHub page. Um, Essentially what Fairtest does is the idea is that they believe these unwarranted associations, so this idea between race and, let's say, getting a bank loan, or gender and getting a bank loan. These are sort of bugs in your data analysis. And so how they designed Fairtest is that it's sort of a way to debug these unwarranted associations in your data. And they do this using a, dis a modified decision tree algorithm called the Association Guided Tree Construction Algorithm. And so this is where the, that may, may seem like maybe a tangent on information theory actually comes into play. Because the way that they do this modified decision tree is by using that information bottleneck problem I was talking about. Like, oh, hey, try to maximize the information gain between the features and the labels while trying to minimize the information gain between the features and our protected variables. And the cool thing about this is that it like, also provides a framework for testing whether there's unwarranted associations. And but also provides you a mean for debugging these un, uh, uh, sources of algorithmic bias. And so, like, I've, like, there are people who do, like, sort of argue against this because it's like, okay, if you do debug these biases, you're sort of affecting your model and sort of injecting your own political views into the model that, like, oh, hey, we should be promoting equality and cal uh, equity. But at least with this framework, you can at least know that a bias is there. Like, even if you don't want to remove it because you believe that's, like, overstepping your bounds as a data scientist and leave that to, like, the policy practi uh, practitioners or whoever is the more applied scientist in your team, you should at least know as a good data scientist that this bias is there. And so how the association guided decision tree works? Well, how does the standard decision tree work? We, with standard decision tree, you produce subsets of the training data by branching on the feature that maximizes the amount of information gained. With the association guided decision tree, we're going to produce subsets of the data by partitioning along some specified protected variable. So you're going to say, like, I want to protect variables such as race or gender or sexual orientation. 
And it'll basically make partitions along race, then it'll make partitions along gender, and then it'll make partitions along sexual orientation. And then you can score each of these partitions uh, with some specified metric, and you can see how well it performs to the overall data. And this allows you to see if, like, maybe there's a higher association between one of your subpopulations and the overall data set. So maybe, like, one uh, particular race has a higher association uh, with this um, score higher compared to the overall data set. It's like, oh, hey, there's bias towards this particular race or bias against this particular race. And so the nice thing about the fair test framework is that it's very easy to use. Um, well, actually, easy to use is kind of weird. So one, it uses R and RPy2 in the back. Uh, so that's kind of hard to install. But fortunately, they provide a virtual machine with this all set up for you. So you, I would re prefer just using their virtual machine and just running off like um, virtual VM. Um, and just using that. And so what you can do is like it has a very nice API. So you can just like import the testing um, library, and then you specify the variables you want to protect. So that's like sex and race. Your target will be like the label you're trying to predict. So this could be income. And your explanatory, uh, that's a particular like possible confounding variable. So there's like a very famous experiment, like um, Berkeley's uh, graduate acceptance rate. And it's like, oh, hey, this is, Berke uh, this is often called, um, talked about with the Simpsons paradox, like, oh, hey, Berkeley seems to be accepting more men than women, but if you look at the departmental, departmental level, they seem to be accepting more women than men for each department. Um, and so that could be like a uh, confounding variable. And so you can do this and just like run it through, just like testing, passing the data, the protected variable, the target variable, and any confounders, and you can get an output, and it'll basically show you um, what do you think is um, basically any like bad associations it finds, any subpopulations that are highly associated or highly discriminated against by this algorithm. And similarly, you can do error profiling. So this is uh, sort of the, this is the debugging part, like where you want to debug these associations. And how this works is you, it's basically the same framework as testing, except now the target is your labels, and the ground truth is essentially, uh, so the labels of your like, classifier, and the ground truth is like the actual labels of the data. And you can see how well your algorithm compares to like this ground truth, uh, the ground truth of the labels. And so this basically tries to find, um, so this just tries to do like, the optimization problem. Like, okay, uh, maybe you have to learn race or um, sex a bit in order to get good accuracy. And this tells you, okay, if you specify some threshold, uh, are you above those thresholds or not? And that's what this does. And so finally, I just want to leave you with some organizations and some further resources for those of you who are interested in this like, general topic of like, ethical data science or fair machine learning. So the first one is um, Fairness, Accountability, and Transparency in Machine Learning. So this is a special like, research group that aims to promote research and scientific outreach of frameworks and methodologies for like, fairness, accountability, and transparency. Transparency referring to the fact that like, a lot of machine learning models, especially deep learning, are black boxes. And we don't want that. You can't explain a black box to someone. And that's very huge, because we were talking about like, teacher evaluation. If you evaluate a teacher using a black box, how is the teacher going to know what they need to do better? They just get some score from an algorithm, and it's like, why do they get the score? It's like, I don't know. The algorithm said so. Uh, that's kind of bad. Uh, and next, like, in the fairness, the FATML is like, basically hosted at, once a year at like, one of the major machine learning uh, uh, or data science research conferences. So this year, I believe it's going to be held at NIPS in December. Uh, last year, it was held at ICML, the Inter International Conference of Machine Learning. Uh, two years before that, it was at K uh, KDD. And one thing that's really cool about this is that it brings together like, industry researchers from companies like Google and Microsoft, where they develop products that can have adverse impact, uh, impact on people, like Google Photos or Microsoft Tay. Um, <laughs> that's some flashbacks. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and along with academic researchers who can like, work on more like, theoretical uh, frameworks for these types of problems. And uh, the next resource is the Data for Good Exchange. Uh, so this is actually held in New York City. So uh, basically, when there's a big data science conference called O'Reilly Plus Strata Hadoop World. It was actually just last week or two weeks ago. Uh, actually, I think it was, yeah, I think two weeks ago. Uh, but basically, since everyone across the world is in, like, in New York City for this like, giant data science conference, Bloomberg decides they're going to host this free one-day Data for Good Exchange conference um, right before that occurs. And so this conference is brings together academic researchers, government officials, and policymakers to talk about uh, basically how can we use data science to solve problems with high societal impact. 
So this could be designing better government services, this could be uh, fighting human trafficking, this could be how we just uh, deal with food and hunger and over, um, I guess, lack of food for people. And it's a great combination of applied work, theoretical work, and research. So like applied work by like government officials and policymakers, theoretical work by, I guess, uh, more academic researchers and research. And also you can learn some like best practices. And I think it's an interesting way to like network with people who are interested in the same types of problems that you are, but don't come from the same background as you. So like if we're here, like everyone here to a certain extent has some background in tech, but if you go to this kind of conference, you can meet like policymakers who don't really have backgrounds in tech, and they can bring like completely brand new perspectives on how to tackle certain problems. So you don't do the like, well, we should tackle this social good problem like the way we build an app. <laughs> So that's the end of my talk. So I guess I have a couple minutes left, and so I can take some questions. Yeah. So, I'm weak on the math, but so from what I understood of the library, it just sort of protects certain classifiers or variables that you want to say be aware not to form these associations, or at least tell me how you're forming them. What about like proxy, like zip code, right? As a proxy for race, like yeah. how does it? Like, do you as the data scientist have to identify that? So if you, if you do like zip code being as a proxy for race, it will essentially tell you that uh, because you specify across like uh, the protected variables. So if you learn, so it will basically say like, oh hey, race is like highly correlated with zip code and it will like learn that in the associate, I mean it does the subgroup associations and it will return that to you like, oh hey, that race is like particularly, has this like, algorithmic bias towards this particular feature. What if you don't have like the race data, you just have zip code data as part of your data? You know what I'm saying? Like, so if you don't have the race data, I mean, you can't like really figure that out if you don't have the data there. Like you need some knowledge of that to be there somehow. Like you can't just like magically infer a race if you don't have any information about that. Yes. Uh, what are your thoughts on the algorithmic transparency bill that Council Member Vaca is introducing before the New York City Council that has its hearing on October 16th? Um, I actually don't know about that. I live in New Jersey. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, thanks so much. Um, another example I've come across is in the, in the area of learning analytics, where that's often a euphemism for you know intervening and, and kicking people out of classes and maybe offering them help in a benign sense, maybe maybe not. And when I talk to folks about implementations, even in open projects, they'll just be all the demographic data or registrar data into the system. And for starters, I've wondered about the legality of that. But the other thing that I want to bring up here in the context of your conversation is that I feel in all these situations, it's really important to explain folks to folks how they ended up in a certain category, and so yeah. where and how, like, do you imagine ways in which you can explain to somebody why they might have gotten this answer, the answer that they did? So that's, um, I guess, like, if I go back to, like, the idea of, like, fairness, trans accountability, and transparency, so, like, this talk was mostly focused on the fairness part, and so, like, how do you explain why a model and how you ended up in a certain category is more of, like, transparency part, and so that's more of, like, um, I guess, like, when you have models like deep learning, which are very black box just due to, like, the complicated nature of the model, um, it's really hard to explain that, and so I guess it's a push, um, push uh, to basically make use explainable models when you do like things like learning analytics or like um, so like Compass. I guess the uh, you talk about like prison recidivism, Compass. That's a black box, but it's actually something simple. It's like it's probably like a decision tree or logistic regression. The proprietor company doesn't want to tell us what it is, but we're pretty sure it's that. And so they can open that up and tell um, tell us how that works. And so the idea is with like learning analytics, we want to be pushed towards like simpler models like logistic regression or decision trees that we can easily explain to people. Like there's a difference between model, easy models that we can explain to people where we choose not to do so for proprietary reasons and versus using like super complex models that we can't explain just because the mathematics is not caught up to it yet. Yeah. Is this the biasing something that you've been implementing and using your everyday life? Uh, so I'm using it a bit. Uh, so I like recently started at my current company, App Eagle. And so we sort of do like e-commerce intelligence kind of things. Yeah. And so it's like something I'm implementing now. We've not like officially deployed a system that uses this kind of stuff yet, but it's something we're, I'm architecting right now. Yeah. Have you considered, um, so there's a lot of work starting now about this, which is really great. Have you considered any um, ways to maybe explain this in a visual context? Right? Sometimes the probabilities fall, fall flat with people. Obviously, what you and I understand, but yeah. for other folks, it might fall short. Have you thought through any visualization strategy uh, so I'm like not really a good visual person. Yeah, I mean, like uh, the main example I used to explain that probabilities are like not intuitive is usually like the President Trump example, 
uh, just because people understand like, oh hey, 30% uh, big event, and then the 25, no one get like freaks out about the two coin flips. But like, I've not come up with any good visual way to represent this stuff. Okay. Uh, we have time. Yeah. <laughs>